The Northern Lights, the Aurora Borealis. What is this strange phenomenon which has long awed and puzzled the people of the North? The Norsemen thought it was the flashing of Valkyrie armor. The Cree Indians believed it was the campfires of the great spirits. Others that it was the sun reflecting from Arctic ice. Today we know that these lights are a complex interplay of physical forces. The Earth is a giant magnet, its field extending far out into space. High velocity charged particles, most of them from the sun, enter this magnetic field and become trapped. They spiral back and forth along the lines of the field, forming what is known as the Van Allen belt. Towards the poles, this belt approaches closest to the Earth, and some of the particles may enter the upper atmosphere. The collision of such particles with atoms of oxygen or nitrogen causes excitation of the atoms and results in the radiation of light. This is the aurora. Because the Earth's axis does not coincide with the axis of the magnetic field, the area in which the aurora most frequently occurs lies much farther south in Canada than in other countries. Churchill, Manitoba lies within this region and has long been a favored site for investigations of the aurora and the ionosphere. Churchill's old Fort Prince of Wales has been a scene of scientific activity since 1769, when astronomers came here from the Royal Society of London to observe the transit of Venus. Today at Fort Churchill, rockets are launched into the aurora to probe its secrets. This is the rocket range. The vast area of Hudson's Bay makes it ideal for receiving spent rockets and the isolation of the range reduces the hazard of launchings. In the early 1930s, the National Research Council began studies of the ionosphere and in particular, its effect on radio communication. The knowledge and techniques acquired are now being applied to the direct measurement of the structure and behavior of the upper atmosphere by means of rocket soundings. Many complex devices are required to measure cosmic rays, charged particle densities, temperature, pressure, and electric and magnetic fields. This package, ejected from the rocket by a powerful spring, is designed to measure electron densities and to transmit the information back to Earth through the folding antennas. Great care is exercised in both design and fabrication, since a single component failure may jeopardize an entire experiment. New equipment, often of novel design, is continually being developed. This is a transistorized transmitter. The nose cone framework also carries instruments to determine the position and attitude of the rocket. Space is at a premium in the nose cone, and plastic models of the instruments are fitted first into a plexiglass replica of the cone. All equipment must be built to withstand the rigorous conditions of rocket flight, acceleration, heat, vibration, and the vacuum existing at high altitudes. Components must be small and light, and take a minimum of power for their operation. Canadian university groups design and build many of the experiments. The rest originate in various divisions of the National Research Council. At Canadian Bristol Aerojet in Winnipeg, the Black Brant series of solid fuel rockets are now being built. Here they undergo tests to measure the center of gravity and moment of inertia. Careful control of their aerodynamic properties is essential to ensure successful flight. Many countries have shown interest in the Black Brant, and it's expected to become an important export item.
the interior surfaces of the engine nozzle must be coated with a ceramic material since the propellant burns at a temperature of 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The cylindrical motor casing must be fabricated to very close tolerances and careful control is maintained at all stages in the process. Since ballistic rockets cannot be guided during flight, the accuracy of their trajectory depends upon the precision with which they are made. At Rockwood, near Winnipeg, Bristol has Canada's only rocket propellant plant. The motor casing is lowered into the filling pit to receive the polyurethane ammonium perchlorate propellant developed by the Canadian Armament Research and Development Establishment. Filling the rocket is an operation which must be accomplished by remote control from the safety of a blast-proof blockhouse. The volatile fuel ingredients must be mixed under exact temperature and humidity conditions. The fuel is added to the oxidizer in the mixer, which moves over the motor casing to fill it. Churchill maintains a permanent laboratory where a continuous program of upper atmosphere observations has been carried out for many years. Its facilities are available to all the American, British, and Canadian scientists who go there to fire rockets. At pre-flight meetings, the scientists and range supervisors discuss the details of the launch. Each experiment has its own vast pattern of interlocking requirements, which must be perfectly coordinated. In the user's room, the payload is given a thorough checkout to ensure that it has made the thousand mile trip from Ottawa unimpaired. Technicians check every single circuit. Batteries are installed and final connections made. The sensing devices, which will measure temperature, pressure, electric and magnetic fields, vibration and acceleration, are checked for calibration purposes and the results recorded automatically for future reference. Hazardous assembly. Permission granted. Okay, take it away. Okay. Payload ready, the nose cone goes to the hazardous assembly area to be joined to the rocket motor. Hot air will be pumped through the plastic sleeve to keep the rocket warm when it is to be fired from the outside launcher. For this rocket, clear skies and light winds are required. Even though it can't be seen, the aurora is often active during the daylight hours. Its presence can be confirmed by radar and other radio signals. Last-minute readings of the upper winds enable the launcher to be aimed correctly. In a climate where the temperature may fall to 50 degrees below zero, even a light wind can make outside work difficult. The rocket is mounted on the launcher and control cables connected within the shelter of removable walls. The hot air blowers will maintain the rocket's temperature above freezing. The rocket's transmitter is now operating. Antennas which will follow the flight are already picking up the signals. The receivers in the telemetry room are tuned up. As soon as all is ready, the word is passed to firing control. Are you on frequency? Okay, right. Impact area clear. 
Flimsy signal is strong and steady at 50 microvolts. Roger, Tim. 82.5. Final computations confirm that the rocket will fall in the safe area. Only when he is satisfied that the rocket course will be true and that the launch site is clear of range personnel, does the safety officer hand over the key for firing. Radar is locked onto the rocket. Minus 20. Minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, fire. thousand miles per hour it will go to a height of 100 miles 10 to 15 seconds after blastoff it encounters the maximum area of cosmic rays 75 to 80 miles up the auroral zone the rocket transmits its valuable information back to the ground receivers and a recording is made on tape for later analysis simultaneously some information is put on strip charts for immediate reference the results are locked up in a roll of recording tape and a few hundred feet of paper chart. From the master tape, each scientist can calculate the results in which he is interested. These are analyzed in great detail and new information is revealed on the upper atmosphere. The origin and behavior of cosmic rays, the temperature and constitution of the upper atmosphere, emissions from the sun, and the fine structure of an auroral display. The aurora occurs in greater concentration over Canada than over any other country on Earth, and this creates a unique scientific obligation for this country. Each rocket that penetrates Canada's northern skies adds to the world's knowledge of the Earth and its environment. Four, 